Thank you for joining us. My name is Audrey Hassan, patient liaison for the MDS Foundation, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Acceleron, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Jazz, Novartis, and Takeda for supporting this webinar program. Please note that this is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. The live questions with answers opportunities for all participants are included at the end of this presentation. Today's presenter is Dr. James Foran, an oncology specialist in practice for more than 20 years treating leukemia, lymphoma, and myelodysplastic syndromes at the Mayo Clinics Florida campus. His clinical focus is on clinical investigation of novel agents in acute leukemia and MDS, studies of leukemia, epidemiology, and of healthcare disparities in malignant hematology. He serves on the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, ECOG, Leukemia Core Committee, is a member of the Interlymph Epidemiology Consortium, and is the principal investigator of multiple early phase clinical studies, including the National Study Chair of ECOG E2906 Intensive Induction Regimen. He is an ad hoc member of the National Cancer Institute Leukemia Steering Committee and serves as chair of the Enterprise Acute Leukemia and Myeloid Neoplasm Disease Group in the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. He has also published more than 50 peer-reviewed manuscripts and textbook chapters on leukemia, lymphoma, and MDS. So with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Foran. Thank you very much and welcome to this presentation on myelodysplastic syndromes, therapy, and options in 2020. I'm James Foran. I'm an associate professor at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. I'm based in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, very happy you're joining us on a Saturday or whatever day you're actually downloading this and watching this if it's not Saturday. I wanted to present some background on MDS. This is a uh, figure, it's sort of an old medical school figure on the hematopoietic cascade. And really, this is how we think about blood production. You can see on the far left of the screen are the early bone marrow cells. We call them pluripotent stem cells. From that is derived the lymphoid cells down below and then blood cells above. And we think it's those early cells that are more in the green or green blue. The early col the colony forming cells are the ones that become damaged. Those are the stem cells that become damaged and lead to MDS. The manifestations of MDS can involve the red blood cells, the platelets, the granulocytes, or the monocytes, depending on which of those cell lines is a little more involved, or it can be any combination of those. And it's really those early stem cells that we believe are damaged or contribute to the disease. So what's the definition of MDS? Well, it's heterogeneous. It's a clonal hematopoietic disorder. That means that it looks different in different people. It's clonal, which means it grows in a similar way to other cancer cells, actually. It's derived from that early bone marrow cell that we call a pluripotent or multipotent progenitor cell. And in MDS, it's characterized typically by a hyperactive or hyperproliferative bone marrow, but with low blood counts. So almost paradoxically, you see a hyperactive marrow, low blood counts. That's uh, pathognomonic or, or at least very common in MDS. And the cells show changes of dysplasia or stress or damage is how we think of them. In panel A, you can see stressed or damaged looking neutrophils or early white cell precursors. In panel B, in the upper right hand corner, you can see abnormal red cell precursors. Panel C are abnormal platelet precursors called megakaryocytes. And then the cell in the bottom right hand corner with the kind of a ring of little blue dots around it, that's called a ring sideroblast, which is an abnormal red cell or early red cell that can happen in the disease. So you end up typically with low blood counts. The medical term for that is ineffective hematopoiesis. And if there's a low blood count, whether it's a red cell count or white cell count or platelet count, we call that a cytopenia. So the disease is characterized by hyperproliferative or hyperactive bone marrow, paradoxically low blood counts because the cells don't grow effectively, damaged or stressed looking cells, and then a risk of transforming to leukemia called AML. Importantly, we do think of MDS as a blood cancer. It's considered a cancer in the modern classifications under the umbrella of a blood cancer. It's an important point for people because it doesn't behave like other cancers and that can be a little bit of a difficult concept. So what are the manifestations? Well, we do see nonspecific symptoms related to the blood counts. Um, if you're anemic, you can be tired. If you have low white cells, you can have fevers or infections, low uh, platelets, you can have bleeding or bruising. 
it can just be an incidental finding where you may not have symptoms and somebody picks it up on a blood count done for another reason. Commonly, we see fatigue, easy bruising or bleeding, increased risk of infection, sometimes shortness of breath that goes along with anemia. Rarely, we'll see weight loss or sweats or itching or bone pains or joint pains. That's less common. Classically, we see a low blood count, a complete blood count, CBC, with abnormal forms. If it's low red cells, that's called anemia. You'll have fatigue or weakness or shortness of breath. Low platelets, bruising or bleeding. Low white cell count, fever or infection. And as I mentioned earlier, a risk that this could actually turn into frank leukemia, which can be difficult if that happens. I want to talk just for a minute about statistics. Um, You've heard the expression that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, and statistics don't always tell the story. Uh, This is a quote um, from an Arthur Conan Doyle novel, The Sign of Four, by Sherlock Holmes. You can, for example, never foretell what any one man will do, but you can say with precision what an average number will be up to. Individuals vary, but percentages remain constant, so says the statistician. So the message there is that every person's path is their own and every story is their own and there are some common features. So it's not always easy to say what's going to happen to an individual, but we look back at what's happened to people in the past and that helps us statistically determine what's likely to happen to a group of people with similar characteristics in the future. And that's bridging into prognostic factors in MDS. It's important to determine the prognostic factors. It gives us It gives patients, it gives their families insights into what to expect based on prior experience and prior data. And it's based upon what's happened to those in the past with similar MDS features. An important thing though is that as therapies change, prognosis changes. So many times we're looking back at prognostic symptoms or systems from the late 1990s or early 2000s before we had good therapies or before we had treatments that changed the progression of the disease or improved blood counts so that you can't always extrapolate from that and tell exactly what's gonna happen now. We still use prognostic factors. Uh, They're still relevant to determine eligibility for treatments. Depends on the therapy and depends on the patient, but it helps us individualize the prognosis, individualize the therapy, determine the best timing or selection of treatment. Sometimes it's just transfusions or red cell growth factors. Sometimes it'll be low-dose chemotherapy treatments or even we will talk about allogeneic transplantation to try to cure MDS in some patients. Earlier therapy is generally beneficial for those who have higher risk features. It's usually delayed for those who have lower risk features. And it helps us determine who's eligible for a clinical trial because we're constantly trying to move the field forward and come up with newer, better treatments for MDS. Now, if somebody suspects an MDS diagnosis, we actually run cytogenetics on all patients whenever possible. This is an old figure. It talks about a blood sample for cytogenetics. Actually, we get bone marrow samples. They're much more accurate. That's uh, often the blood counts are low anyway. There are some subtleties about whether we use mitogens or not when we process the cells for cytogenetics. But part of the point of this figure is to show you that even though it's an important test, it's not an easy test. It takes three days just to incubate the cells, and it's many steps to do it. It takes a technician a half day to read a single patient's results once we get the karyotype of the cytogenetics. So it's critical, but takes time, usually five or seven days, and in some labs a little bit longer. And it's important in in MDS for determining how the disease is going to behave. When you think about the prognosis of MDS, there are many things that are intuitive about it. If the blood counts are better, that's a good thing. If you don't need regular blood transfusions, that's also a good thing. If the blast counts are lower, that's better. Blast counts are the early stem cells or the early blast cells that should be one or two percent. If they're over 5%, that's more aggressive, and over 10%, that's moving towards leukemia. 20% or higher, we call that acute myeloid leukemia. So lower blast counts are good. If the, cytogenetic, if the cytogenetics come back looking mostly normal, that's generally a good thing. As you would guess, younger age is better. People are stronger and fitter. And being able to function better, being more independent, or maintaining functional status is a good thing. There are lots of exceptions to these rules, but there are some intuitive parts of MDS prognosis that you would guess at and that actually are true. Now, there is a scoring system based upon what happened to patients in the early 2000s that helps us determine prognosis without treatment. It's based on the cytogenetic risk group, the bone marrow blasts, the hemoglobin, the neutrophil count, neutrophils are the white cells that fight bacteria, and the platelet count, and if they're low, depends on how low they are. Based upon those results, you get a score for good risk cytogenetics or 
for your blast count or so on, and you add up, pardon me, you add up the score, and you end up in a risk group. As you can see, there are five risk groups going from very low to low to intermediate or high risk, and even very high risk, based on the number of points going from zero to six or higher. You can see the distribution of patients. Somewhere around 60% of patients, give or take, will be low risk when they're first diagnosed. Some will be intermediate, and a minority will be high. And you can see without treatment what happens to people based on experience from about 20 years ago, where if they're very low risk features, we know that the median or the average survival is better. If they're very high risk features, that's a more difficult situation and people can get into trouble more quickly. In the far right hand column is the, <clears throat> excuse me, is the time until a quarter of the patients in that group have developed leukemia. And you can see that the risks of leukemia are much higher in the very high risk group in any given year or any given interval than in the low or very low risk groups. So this is the revised International Prognostic Scoring System, or the RIPSS, that we use when we're talking about how to decide on a treatment and for prognosis. Now it's really important to know that there's still heterogeneity in each of these groups. This shows the survival compared to average according to the prognostic score, this IPSS revised score and whether patients are still alive at follow-up over time. And you can see the average for the very low-risk group is up at the top. You can see for the low-risk group, it's that line that goes across the middle of that box. You can see it's lower for the intermediate and the high and the very high, but there's a lot of variability. There are some patients with very low-risk disease who can still get into trouble sooner, and some with high or even very high-risk disease who do better and beyond the average. So that even though we look at this score, it doesn't tell the story for everybody because there is a lot of heterogeneity. Some of that's based on how strong a patient is, what their other diseases might be, if they have diabetes or heart disease or some other medical problem, and also whether there are background mutations in the MDS that are not in the scoring system. And I'll come back to that in a little while. We are trying to move to a more personalized prediction model to risk stratify patients with MDS. Uh, this was uh, just a title slide from a presentation given a year and a half ago from, um, it's actually an international consortium, but led by, uh, by uh, really an outstanding MDS doctor and a friend, Mikhail Sekris, at uh, Cleveland Clinic, and the group at multiple centers nationally and internationally. And I'll come back to this, because in this personalized prediction model, we're trying to determine whether mutations also contribute to the IPSS when we're determining what's going to happen. So what are our strategies and our options for MDS patients? Well, if possible, we observe if there's no symptoms, especially if the blood counts aren't bad. Most patients, about 60%, present with low-grade MDS, and they can remain, sometimes for prolonged periods, they can remain stable. And there's no indication to treat. You're not going to make somebody better by giving them a treatment if they don't have symptoms and they're not requiring transfusions. For low-grade MDS, for lower scores on that revised IPSS, we focus on treating the low blood count, the cytopenia that's causing the symptoms and helping to prevent the MDS from progressing. So if that's anemia, low red cells, which is the most common cytopenia, then we focus on trying to improve that to improve quality of life. If it's intermediate or high grade or high risk MDS, we consider treatment with a hypomethylating agent. We call it an HMA, usually azacitidine or D-cytabine. There are some situations, rarely, where you may use leukemia types of therapy and we will consider allogeneic bone marrow or stem cell transplantation to try to cure some people if the disease is bad enough and if they're a candidate for that therapy. Now, it's important to recognize that this is a model for collaborative care. There's a team involved and it's focused on the patient. We know that's important because this disease occurs more often in older patients, patients who are 70 typically. They can have comorbid diseases, I've mentioned already. They can have diabetes or uh, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, heart disease, and so on. So you really need a more holistic medical care model to look after that person that's based on that person rather than disease. There are some common supportive care requirements. We like to mitigate the effects of the low blood counts. If they're having anemia, then it's transfusion or methods to try to increase the red cell count to make the patient feel stronger, less short of breath, or to address the risk of bleeding for low platelets or the risk of infection for low white cells takes coordination if somebody needs blood products. If somebody needs a transfusion, that's actually a complicated process of getting the blood count, making sure there's a type and screen, coordinating with the blood bank, getting time for that person to go to a transfusion center, monitoring, and sometimes antibiotics if there are infections involved or low white cells.
Many of the treatments for this disease are prolonged. The effects of the disease can worsen in the early stages of therapy. For instance, when you start somebody on azacitidine, you can sometimes go through an episode where the blood gets worse for a month or two, and it feels like you take a step backwards before you start taking two steps forward. And again, this requires close coordination with a care team that involves your physician, an advanced practice provider like a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, often a specialist nurse, and in many cases a social worker, depending on what the patient's needs are and depending on their insurance and what medications they need. We often end up developing very close long-term relationships with patients in the care team because this is something that we're in together for the long haul. And we try to achieve a balance of intervening with the disease, but focusing at the same time on quality of life and the needs of that person. So it is a collaborative care model, and the person and their caregiver and family are very much at the center of that. So what do we do with low-grade or lower-risk MDS? Well, first of all, it's important to rule out a contributing cause. I'm going to give you an estimate of about 10% of patients, give or take, who come in with anemia, are thought to have MDS, but also have iron deficiency. Or maybe they have some subtle bleeding. Or maybe they have some other thing contributing to the anemia, rarely a copper deficiency, if they've had gastric bypass surgery, something like that. So you want to rule out a contributing cause to anemia and not attribute everything to the MDS until you're certain that that's what's going on. For anemia, for low red blood cell count or low hematocrit or low hemoglobin, we transfuse if the red cell count is if the hemoglobin is very low or if the patient has symptoms of fatigue or shortness of breath. I'm sorry, SOB is a medical expression or abbreviation for shortness of breath. We will give injections to try to stimulate the red cells. We call that an erythroid stimulating agent. Typically, we use medications. Um, erythropoietin has different trade names, Procrit or Aranes, but there's a new agent called Lisbatercept that's available that I'll mention. If somebody has a certain cytogenetic group with a 5Q deletion, which can occur uh, relatively commonly in MDS, there's an oral therapy called lenalidomide that can help. For low platelets, for thrombocytopenia, that's a more difficult thing because the treatments are harder then. We only transfuse if someone's got bruising or bleeding or the platelets are very low, less than 10,000 or sometimes 20,000. And so if the platelets are 30 or 40, there aren't that many good treatments available and we don't always intervene if somebody's asymptomatic. There is an oral therapy that's approved for a different platelet disorder called ITP, called l trombopag or Promacta. It's not FDA approved in MDS, but it has been shown in some small randomized studies, as long as it's low risk MDS, that it can sometimes improve the platelet counts. And so if we can access that, we'll sometimes try to get that for patients. It's a little harder with neutropenia. Neutropenia is when you have low white cells, and particularly the neutrophil count, or the neutrophil percentage, which are the cells that fight infection. We typically don't treat if somebody's not having any symptoms or infections. Just because the white cell count is low, we don't jump on that right away if there's no other reason to treat the MDS because there are many patients who will do well for long periods of time. You can give short courses of white cell growth factors like Neupogen. We avoid long-term use because that can stimulate the blast cells. But sometimes that will be helpful if there are recurrent infections. And sometimes if these numbers are all very low, that's an indication to start a low-dose chemotherapy uh, or a hypomethylating agent such as azacitidine or desatabine. It's really important to consider a clinical trial of novel agents if you have access to that. We really need to move the field forward. We have some very good ideas that are now starting to come into clinical trials. And if that's something that you can access, we really like your support in trying to help us get better therapies for MDS, low grade or higher grade. Now, um, this is meant just to make the point that just because something has hoof beats and looks like a horse, maybe it's not a horse. Sometimes there are some, you can see on the screen some zebras showing horse or casting horse shadows. Every now and then there's a zebra, what we call a zebra diagnosis uh, in the background that you have to watch for uh, when you're looking at MDS. And the zebras in this situation, I mentioned them already, are other causes of anemia. Now this is a very complicated slide from a study published several years ago, six years ago looking at anemia around the world and the causes of anemia. And you can see on the left in females and in males, anemia is surprisingly common. Like 30 to 40% of the population of the world can have anemia. It's just that most of the time that's caused by other things like malaria or hookworm or people who have bleeding disorders or, um, gosh, hemorrhage after, uh, after pregnancy. 
A small percentage can have hemoglobin disorders like sickle cell disease or thalassemia can happen. And then in green, you can see iron deficiency. That's quite uncommon in the Western world, but a big problem in other parts of the world, particularly um, in third world countries and in some parts of the, of the world where the diet is different, uh, where you can have iron deficiency or other causes of anemia. And you can see on the right, in North America, we see very little iron deficiency as a cause of anemia, uh, and anemia is less common than other parts of the world. But that's trying to get back to that point of make sure that you don't miss a zebra or at least some other contributing cause of anemia before you start going down the path of treating MDS and make sure that there's not some other cause and that we're really truly correctly attributing it to MDS. And these are some of the other lower prevalence causes of anemia in North America, sickle cell disease, kidney disease, uh, chronic infection, and so on. Now, this slide talks about how we approach patients with lower risk MDS. This is from a presentation uh, from Cleveland Cl uh, uh, Clinic physicians from several years ago, but still holds true today. If somebody has a lower score on that international prognostic scoring system, or the revised IPSS, and they're considered low or lower risk MDS, if they don't need transfusions and their quality of life is good, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we just observe them and we follow blood counts intermittently every one month, every six months, depending on the need. If there's an isolated cytopenia, isolated anemia, and the hemoglobin's low, we'll start a red cell injection or we'll give blood transfusions if somebody needs it. If they don't respond to that or if they have a 5Q deletion, we'll look for treatment with lenalidomide or Revlimid to try to address that. If that cytopenia is thrombocytopenia or low platelets, especially if it's less than 20 or even less than 50 with easy bruising or bleeding, we'll try to get access to a thrombopoietin agonist such as l -trombopag. We don't commonly give platelet transfusions until the number's very low, but we will. And sometimes we'll start a hypomethylating agent. We usually reserve that for higher risk MDS, but it has an indication in lower risk MDS if it's truly profound thrombocytopenia. If there are multiple cytopenias, and really very low blood counts across the board. Even with lower risk scores, we sometimes have to start therapy with a hypomethylating agent. There's a small number of patients who may respond to uh, what we call ATG, which is an immunosuppressive treatment. That's a rare treatment for MDS and a small group will respond, but important consideration for that group. Typically younger patients with a variant of MDS called hypoplastic MDS. What are the goals for lower risk MDS and what are the options for them? Well, the goals, we want to enhance their quality of life during illness. We want to eliminate or reduce or prevent transfusions. Certainly try to delay the time that this could turn into AML and in the right circumstances, try to effect a cure with a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant. But really the major focus is on trying to improve the anemia or reduce the need for transfusions for that patient. Now, anemia is the most common of the low blood counts, it does unfortunately tend to worsen over time. It requires regular monitoring and prospective monitoring. And really, you need to be able to track the frequency of transfusions. That helps us decide when to intervene and also helps us determine when a treatment's making an impact if someone starts to reduce their transfusion needs. Most of the treatments are every week or every two weeks, so that requires regular visits. And sometimes that's a little bit difficult for patients because they come, well, they become tethered to the clinic a little bit because they have to have their blood count checked every week or every two weeks, typically. We'll give red cell stimulating agents or an ESA, Procrit or Aronis. Sometimes we add Neupogen to that. Occasionally, there's some synergy of adding the white cell growth factor, even if the white cells are not low. If that doesn't work or if that patient's not a candidate for an ESA, there's a recently approved treatment called Lespatercept. It's FDA approved and can work itself in about a third of patients, give or take. And an important consideration, there's a move nationally called Choose Wisely. And part of the Choose Wisely in hematology campaign is to only give transfusions when somebody needs it. Red cells are a precious resource. It's an expensive resource. There are some side effects of red cell transfusion that'll come to, especially iron overload. And so generally we only give them if somebody needs it. We typically try to keep someone's hemoglobin above seven when possible. There are some people who just need to run a higher number. There's no doubt that if your number is a little higher, eight or nine or even 10, people can feel a little stronger, or some people can. And there are those who have underlying diseases like heart disease where they may need to run a higher number. You can individualize that threshold in that situation. And what I mean by that is sometimes somebody needs to run eight instead of seven, or eight and a half, or even nine. Not a common scenario, but that's something you can discuss 
and even negotiate a little bit with your hematologist if you're undergoing transfusion therapy for MDS. I mentioned earlier that this does require a coordinated care team. This really requires close coordination between the nurse, the physician, and the blood bank. So there's education involved on the effects of anemia, the symptoms of it, and transfusion. And really, it's important that you and your family or your caregiver participate in the care and make sure you understand why you're getting that transfusion. You have some gauge as to how much it helps you, and we're keeping you on transfusions in the right way. Now, I mentioned that Lespatercept is FDA approved in the United States. That just happened this spring. Uh, this is a snapshot of both the title of the paper and the authors of the paper and the conclusions from the abstract of that paper published in one of our most prestigious journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, in January of this year. But it was shown that if somebody has anemia with MDS and they have that type of MDS with ringed sideroblasts, and they're receiving regular transfusions and they didn't respond to a regular red cell stimulating agent called an ESA, they may respond to less batercept, and it's now an available agent for patients, and that's something you can discuss with your hematologist about whether and when that's appropriate for you. I did want to talk about the risks of infection for patients who have low white cell count. It's really related to the degree of neutropenia. The penia part means small or low, and neutro refers to the neutrophil. So a low neutrophil count is neutropenia. You take the white cell count, you um, um, <clears throat> times that by the percent of neutrophils, and you get something that we call the ANC, the absolute neutrophil count. So if your white cell count is four and you're 50% neutrophils, then that's an absolute neutrophil count of two. It's half of the white cells. And really, neutropenia is when the white cell count or the neutrophil count is less than 1,000. The lower it goes, the higher the risk of infection. So it's important to be aware of that. If you have a temperature, of greater than 101.4 Fahrenheit or 38.3 Celsius, you really need to call your on-call doctor or your daytime doctor to discuss whether or not you have neutropenia and whether you should start on antibiotics to cover bacterial infections. We have some patients where we'll even give them long-term antibiotics as prophylaxis to prevent infection if they have long-term neutropenia and they've had infections before. We use Leviquin, it's the trade name for levofloxacin or ceftonir in that situation. Occasionally, we'll give a short course of white cell growth factors, although we don't give that routinely. It's usually only intermittent, just because there can be some other um, risk of, the, of MDS progressing to leukemia if someone's on prolonged neupogen. Now, this is what cytogenetics look like. And you can see that you've got two copies of each chromosome. The chromosomes are numbered from the largest, which is chromosome 1, to the smallest, which is chromosome 22. This is, in this case, a woman who has two X chromosomes that are uh, in addition to this. And one of the most common abnormalities you can see with this arrow in the right upper corner is a loss of one of the long arms of chromosome five. We call that a deletion of 5Q. And that's a well-known entity in MDS. And the reason that's important is that patients with lower risk MDS with a deletion 5Q or a loss of some genetic material in chromosome five often respond to Revlimid, or lenalidomide is, is the uh, generic name. And actually this is a, a well-known medicine, works in different or other blood cancers as well, but an MDS was the first uh, diagnosis that it was approved in at lower doses, and lenalidomide can improve the hemoglobin and get people off transfusions almost two-thirds of the time, sometimes for prolonged periods. If it works, the average is for two years, and there are patients who go beyond two years. Generally well-tolerated. Um, you do have to, you see the warning in the middle of the screen, potential for human birth defects. So there's a government program where you have to be monitored or at least a log in to using appropriate contraception if that's a risk for you. Um, but uh, lenalidomide is a very active drug in patients with lower risk MDS and a, and a chromosome 5 abnormality called a deletion 5Q. Now I wanted to stop for one second and just to mention the issue of iron overload. Every time you get a red cell transfusion, you get iron with those red cells. Once those red cells are turned over, the end of their lifespan, in 100 or 120 or sometimes 150 days, they're recycled, but they leave the iron behind. And that iron accumulates in organs in your body, in the bone marrow, in the liver, in the heart, and other areas. And there is the potential for long-term side effects from regular red cell transfusion as iron levels build up. It can contribute to liver disease or cirrhosis, heart disease or heart failure, Endocrine problems uh, can worsen diabetes, as an example. Even potentially increase the risk of infection. 
So it's routine if someone's getting regular blood transfusions to monitor their iron level in their blood with, a ferret, with, with ferritin. And once the ferritin goes elevated over 1,500, and especially over 2,500, we're often considering or at least discussing whether somebody should be on an oral chelation therapy called iron chelation to try to remove some of that iron because the body has no other normal system for removing iron from the body. These images are just images of the liver on an MRI, and you can see the brightness, especially in the left, on the left side, um, that correlates with how much iron is in the liver. Uh, in pediatrics, it's very common to deliver MRIs to do something called a T2 star signal to see how much iron is in the liver, and we've started doing that even more and more in adults who get regular transfusions to see what is the iron burden, is it storing in the liver or heart, and will that help us make a decision on iron chelation? There is an oral medication that's available for iron chelation for lower risk MDS. It's called Deferocyrox. There are a couple of uh, uh, trade names. Jade New uh, is a better tolerated version or X-Jade. And there was a randomized study called the Telesto study that showed on average it brought down iron levels and on average there were fewer long-term side effects from iron. Wasn't exactly clear that people had a major benefit or not everybody did but it's a consideration. Uh, there are some centers that believe more strongly in it than others. We tend to believe a little more in iron chelation, but it's absolutely worth checking the ferritin level and discussing that with your hematologist. We know anemia is the most chronic or the most frequent cytopenia in MDS. We know transfusion support is an important supportive care, and we know secondary iron overload happens from regular transfusions, especially if you've had 15 or 20 transfusions or more, you start to see iron build up. And we know that iron buildup is associated with worse survival and possible cardiac disease or liver disease or other organ toxicities. This statement in the, in the middle, iron chelation may improve outcomes, that's from a position paper from really one of the very famous doctors in MDS at the University of Rochester named uh, uh, Dr. John Bennett. This is in Rochester, New York. And the consideration in that piece, in, in that paper from over 10 years ago, was that chelation should be considered for lower risk patients if someone's going to be on prolonged transfusion support and the ferritin is high. And if you think that patient's really got the potential to take the side effects or the monitoring needed to be on chelation, you don't want to do chelation just to change the number. You want to make sure it's worth it for that patient. And as I mentioned, this recent Telesto study does show a possible advantage in some cardiac or liver or clinical events. Um, with oral iron chelation. And so that's a conversation about balancing the benefits of chelation with the expense of the medicine and the side effects that, that we'd really encourage you to have with your hematologist. Now I want to shift over to high-grade MDS or intermediate or higher risk MDS. At diagnosis, this is really only about a third of patients, maybe just a little bit more, but even lower risk patients can ultimately become higher risk over time if the disease worsens. This is a more difficult situation. Patients are more symptomatic, and it's a more advanced MDS. If somebody comes in with, with high risk or very high risk MDS, and even some patients with intermediate risk MDS, we do consider starting what we call systemic therapy with azacitidine or decitabine. We call this hypomethylating agents. You may hear your doctor refer to an HMA or a hypomethylating agent. And that's a low dose or low intensity chemotherapy that's given for five days for decitabine or seven days for azacitidine. The decitabine's IV, although there's a new oral version now, the azacitidine can be a subcutaneous injection or IV. And it's continued every four weeks for as long as it continues to work. Now, it doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't work forever. But we know in the head-to-head -head studies that there was an advantage of being on treatment, particularly for people with higher risk MDS, that on average, people were more likely to come off transfusions more likely to feel better, more likely to live longer, even if it's not a cure. And so the standard is still to consider a treatment such as azacitidine for higher risk MDS. And as I mentioned, there is an oral version that was just approved in the United States by the FDA. It's a combination of decitabine with a medicine that helps it get absorbed called cetazuridine. So that combination of pills called Incovi, it's now available as a pill for five days, very recently approved in the last month um, or the last six weeks. If somebody has higher risk MDS, particularly if they're under the age of 75, we really do think it's worth discussing being evaluated in a bone marrow transplant program. Bone marrow transplant's not for everybody, I'll come to that in a minute, but at least to learn about it and consider whether that's an option for you. Just because you have high risk disease, you may still need transfusions, you still need to stay on that or antibiotics. 
Not everybody responds to azacitidine or desitabine, and that's a difficult situation if you're resistant in MDS, and that's, that's an area where we're looking on clinical trials for better options for patients because it's a very individualized decision as to what treatment works. I do want to mention clinical trials for a moment, and um, there are some um, very important studies that are unfolding nationally, some just completed as well that we're waiting for reads on to see can we add new medications to an HMA, to azacitidine or desitabine to make them more effective, to add synergy to improve the efficacy of those treatments. So we're hoping we do find something. There's a potential role for some targeted treatments that are being evaluated and also for some immunotherapy type treatments where antibody type treatments that try to leverage or harness the immune system are being added to low-dose chemotherapy with azacitidine or desitabine. These include immune checkpoint inhibitors or treatments that target um, CD47, which helps uh, hide MDS from the immune system, or even that tries to harness T cells, immune cells, to help recognize MDS and fight it. There's a pressing need for new agents in MDS, particularly for those when the standard HMA therapy is no longer working. So we are uh, very engaged and very much behind clinical trials. We think we give some of our best treatments on clinical trials. We follow very careful rules on clinical trials. And I would encourage you to look for clinical trial options um, and to help us find ways to improve this disease for patients. Now, this is the algorithm that's been proposed also from the Cleveland Clinic doctors. This is a six-year-old paper, but it still holds true today. If somebody has higher risk MDS, if they're not a good candidate for a transplant, they're not physically strong, or they're over 75, um, or they don't have a caregiver, then we would recommend starting, it's on the left-hand side, going immediately to hypomethylating agents, a clinical trial if we can find one. If that works, you continue it. If that stops working, we look for a novel agent, maybe on a clinical trial. If the person is a potential candidate for a transplant, we really recommend they be seen sooner rather than later at a transplant center. We initiate a search to look for a matched related donor, or uh, it's now a 10 out of 10 unrelated donor. If that person is older, especially if the MDS is not too aggressive or not right on the cusp of leukemia, we often recommend going on to an immediate hypomethylating agent like azacitidine or desitabine. If they respond to treatment and we identify a donor, we move to transplant to try to cure the disease. If the patient's younger or fitter, We'll sometimes even treat like AML to try to clear the MDS faster and try to get to a transplant. So it depends on the person and their individual needs, but in all these cases, we're starting to talk about treatment early in the course rather than delaying treatment because the disease is more risky in this situation and the outcomes are worse if you delay initiation of treatment for long periods of time. An important question is, what does success look like when you're treating MDS? Well, you really do have to set expectations and goals with that person because not all patients experience a major improvement. Some do. It really takes three to six months to see as a treatment starting to work, so you have to be patient when you go through it. We're looking for improvements in the blood count and the complete blood count, the CBC. We're looking for a decrease in the frequency or, of transfusions or even independence from transfusions. We want to see improved quality of life or maintaining quality of life scores. We really want to achieve a goal with patients of helping them be stronger with better stamina and becoming or maintaining independence. Treatment has continued long-term to maintain that benefit and maintain that stability. There are some people who don't clearly get better but don't get worse and sometimes stay stable. And that can be a reasonable goal for some people to maintain stability if the MDS is not worsening. The disease is hard to cure and the goal is often to maintain control except in those situations where a stem cell or bone marrow transplant is feasible for somebody. Now, I did mention earlier that you do have to stop and look at the fine print in MDS, and that gets us to mutations in MDS because that's a new and unfolding field uh, that we've learned about really only the last five years that studies are coming forward to teach us that. This is an actual road sign uh, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, in Western Canada. It says, caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of the sign. But then you see in the small print below, also, the bridge is out ahead. So mutations are the small print. And looking at DNA level testing is the small print that you have to look at to get a better understanding of the disease and find new ways to treat it. So what is a mutation? Well, we all have DNA, obviously. Every cell has DNA. Every cell that's in growth unwinds and, re and copies and rewinds their DNA in the bone marrow three to four times a day for a stem cell. 
And a mutation is not something you're born with. It's something that happens over time. You, re you acquire a change in the sequence of the DNA, sometimes just a single letter change, in fact, typically a single letter change that changes how the DNA gets read so that it becomes missense or nonsense and causes or contributes to the development of MDS and other cancers. So a mutation is a change that occurs in our DNA sequence over time due to mistakes when the DNA is copied or sometimes as a, revol as a result of environmental factors. In the case of skin, you may see uh, heavy UV light causing mutations or cigarette smoke in the lung. Those are examples of something in the environment that could actually change DNA sequence. It disrupts the normal activity of our genes when you get out of sequence and it can contribute to diseases like cancer. And mutations contribute to the prognosis with our standard treatments. In the bottom, I've put in italics, it might, in some cases, not commonly, but about 10%, might even be able to, possible to target some gene mutations in MDS, and we're hoping to find more opportunities for that. So why should we care about mutations? Well, they give us clue as to what went wrong in the MDS cells, so clue to the biology of the disease. Helps us make a diagnosis of MDS if it's kind of a difficult to read bone marrow, but we see mutations that support MDS. That's very helpful. Some mutations predict the outcome, and so it helps in prognosis. That's also true in other bone marrow diseases. And sometimes they help us choose the right medicines or the right strategy to treat the disease as it does in other bone marrow diseases. And so mutations help us develop new targeted therapies in MDS or better use of the ones that we have available now. And so it's now becoming routine to do a mutation panel of anywhere from 30 to 50 genes to look and see where are the mutations, how's that gonna help us understand how the disease behaves, and occasionally give us a target to go after the disease. Almost 80% of patients in MDS have a detectable mutation, and the average person has two mutations. This is just a list of the number of patients from a large data set that was presented at the hematology meetings 18 months ago, looking at the frequency of mutations in the different genes, like genes and mutations in SF3B1, which are more common, or ASXL1. Um, and at the far right hand of mutations that we rarely see in GATA2 or KIT or WT1. These are genes that have important functions in how DNA is read, how cells grow, um, how cells signal. And it's important to know what the mutations are because it helps us know are there therapeutic options and is this a person who will benefit as much from a transplant or from a targeted therapy or so on. Now, targeting mutations in MDS is still an early or a nascent field. We're still just learning about this. Some rare, but some mutations could potentially be targeted. Those are still on clinical trials. These are some medicines approved in different diseases like acute myeloid leukemia that we're now looking at in clinical trials in MDS. An example are mutations in, in the gene called IDH1 or IDH2, which we can see in maybe 10% of MDS patients approximately. There are some mutations in the DNA um, in uh, genes involved with DNA splicing, when DNA actually unwinds and rewinds. These are a little more common in MDS. These are so, the, some of the genes involved in splicing. We call them spliceosome genes, SF3B1 or SF2, U2AF1, and ZRSR2. Um, we're looking to see if those can be targeted. So far, we've not found a way to do that, but there are trials in development. TP53 can be difficult if we see that in any blood cancer, but there's a medicine that's been studied in a recent clinical trial that we and other centers have contributed to, and we're waiting to see if that shows a benefit in MDS and potentially other mutations that are being looked at. So still an early field, but it's giving us strong leads about how to go after the disease. I wanted to talk briefly about allogeneic transplantation and whether people should be evaluated for allogeneic, allogeneic transplantation or stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, all the same thing. And really this is a balance of hope and reality because it's not for everybody. It can be curative, 40%, 50%, sometimes a little higher or a little lower depending on the situation and the patient and donor, but it's not always. And it's hard and it brings its own risks and not everybody survives them because they're heavy. So that person must be fit. They must have a donor identified that we work on to find somebody who's DNA matched at the HLA markers or the immune system markers. You have to have a caregiver. In general, this is a harder treatment for older patients, particularly over the age of 65 or 70, and especially over the age of 75. Now, having a transplant significantly reduces the risk the MDS comes back. It's more effective if the MDS is under control and the blast count is lower. It's probably better if the iron levels are controlled before transplant, or at least that they're not too high. So there are some factors that the transplant physicians will look at with your hematologist. 
we get improved outcomes in the modern era that we're, era that we're in now. We've got better typing to find unrelated donors with higher resolution molecular typing. We can do reduced intensity transplants so that at least we can try to bring the same benefits to older patients that we can bring to younger patients. And we have improvements in just supporting somebody through a transplant. We call that supportive care. We have better antibiotics and so on that help us get more people through it. There's also an increased availability of donors that it's more likely now we can find a donor than 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So it's more possible. We're getting better outcomes. It's important to discuss it, but it's also not for everybody. And that's an individualized decision. And that happens at a transplant center where it's a patient-centered evaluation and discussion and a decision taken together with the patient, hopefully their, camp, their family or caregiver, and then PMT physicians. And we balance the risk of the MDS and its prognosis with the risks and also the goals or benefits of a transplant. Um, we look at the eligibility. It says leukemia risk, but it's really MDS risk, it should say there. Patient eligibility, whether they have other comorbid diseases, whether uh, they have the capacity to understand and go through it and have the right social support. Whether the donor is available, make sure they have the right insurance to cover them. There are strict national standards that have to be adhered to. Centers go through accreditation by a foundation called FACT that you can see for cell therapy every three years to remain accredited. And there's even a database. There's a, there's a link below you can see there, um, a uh, health uh, and, uh, and human services or hrsa.gov website that you can look for outcomes called the Stem Cell Therapeutic Outcomes Database. So you can look and see, is that transplant center have good outcomes for people in your situation? I wanna come back to something I mentioned before about support and palliative care. This is a coordinated healthcare team. Now, um, it's a little more difficult if the MDS is advanced or somebody's near the end of life or we're talking about hospice care. It's not utilized as often in MDS and probably it's underutilized we don't see pain as frequently an issue in MDS as you might with other types of cancer. And we do have antibiotics available to help fight infections. One of the problems, particularly in the United States, it's difficult to get regular transfusion support when somebody's registered to hospice. There are programs to help with that in some regions of the country, but that makes it harder to access hospice care. And often that person has to stay under care, even towards the end of life with their hematologist. And so that's an important consideration and something where if the MDS, MDS is not responding to treatment or the person's worsening or really starting to fail or their blood is failing to talk about the best way to support that person near the end of life. And that might in include hospice, but just a discussion to have with your hematologist. And I'll finish just with a point about the caregiver because sometimes this falls on the shoulder of family members and friends and spouse and partner and and we're still looking for better systems to care for the caregiver and support the caregiver. There are social work initiatives at Mayo Clinic and many other centers to help support the caregiver. And that's true also for patients who are getting curative treatment after transplant where that caregiver still needs support. So that's an area where we're really trying to improve our resources and get better support for people and for their families. Now I'll finish with a couple of pearls of wisdom. Almost all patients benefit from some kind of treatment. Depends on the scenario and that person's needs, and you have to set individual goals. But it is worth discussing treatment. The second is that current treatments are still not adequate for many patients, and so that we have to work together to advance treatments and advance outcomes. The MDS Foundation and other foundations are fantastic um, entities and foundations to support to really help us in the field get better support for patients, better support for clinical trials, better therapies, and we really need your help and the community's support for clinical trials, and to also develop more molecularly targeted therapies. I'll conclude by saying that the therapy for lower risk disease is focused on that particular blood line or cytopenia that is causing symptoms, particularly anemia or thrombocytopenia. For higher risk, the standard therapy is an HMA treatment, azacitidine or decytabine. There are many new combinations adding medicines to azacitidine and decitabine that are being studied and that are promising and that we're hopeful that we'll get a result in some of them to try to get better outcomes. But we absolutely need new strategies, particularly for resistant MDS. Transplant may be a consideration for some patients, particularly higher risk disease or a lower risk patient who's not responding to treatment or has progressed. And so consider a discussion about transplant or referral to a transplant center to at least know whether that's an option. The landscape at a molecular level is becoming more complex. We're learning that. We're now routinely incorporating mutation testing into the diagnosis, into the prognosis, and also to see if we can predict response to therapy. And hopefully one day 
learn how to target specific mutations. These are some examples. We're waiting to see which one uh, actually works for which patients. I want to just acknowledge the care team I work with at Mayo Clinic. I'm based at the Cancer Center site in Jacksonville, Florida. I have a fantastic nurse, Dana Rollerson, Michael Spears, our nurse practitioner, our BMT coordinators, Jennifer H. in Virginia, our social work support led by Michelle Walsh and others, and also my secretary, Joseph, who uh, really helps uh, coordinate a lot of moving parts for our team. And these are the physician leads at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center sites in Phoenix, Arizona, and Jacksonville, Florida, and also at our large site in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, you can go to mayoclinic.org, also the MDS Foundation, for more information on MDS, uh, or else reach, to us, reach out to us um, at the Mayo Clinic sites. I'll finish with a quote by the Mayo brothers, uh, Will and Charlie Mayo, who founded uh, the first multi-specialty uh, multi clinic in the world in Rochester, Minnesota. And a quote from, from Dr. William J. Mayo uh, that he gave at a medical college address in 1910. Uh, on the left, by the way, is just a, a picture of the outer buildings of the Mayo and Gonda buildings in Rochester, Minnesota. But this quote is, the best, interest, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And in order that the sick may have the benefit of advancing knowledge, a union of forces is necessary. It's important we work together with our care teams, our patients, our caregivers, the MDS Foundation, other excellent foundations to try to advance knowledge and get better outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention and for spending time on a Saturday, or if you're watching this later, out of hours. The first question is from Michael. He said, my wife had a stem cell transplant for MDS with multi-lineage dysplasia about two months ago. A recent bone marrow showed remaining MDS and her counts are not improving. Are there any options to treat? Yeah, Michael, thanks very much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay, and, and Janice, you'll tell me if there's a problem. Um, I'm sorry, that is a bit, that is difficult, but it's also um, early. And two months after transplant, we often will see some residual uh, evidence of stress or damage in the bone marrow. And what's more important in that situation is what is the donor chimerism or what is the donor engraftment percentage that will help guide how things can go? If the blast count is high, that's a little more difficult. But sometimes uh, the transplant physicians can change the anti-rejection medicines to help the donor cells grow in more effectively and start to take. Sometimes it just takes longer for that to happen. And occasionally they'll give an extra dose of cells called donor lymphocytes or DLI to help boost the donor immune system. So I'd say there, there are options, not a dead easy situation, but uh, it's also very early and that's not, I don't know all the details, but that may not necessarily be bad news. And there's going to be um, several maneuvers they can do to try to help with that, I believe. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Alyssa. She wants to know how loose Patercept is dosed for MDS slash rares. Is it based on patient weight? The injections seem to come in 25 or 75 milligram vials. But the, the doctor said that the dose for her dad would be, for her, according to his weight, would be 85 milligrams. Um, he did yeah. first two, the first two at 25, and now the last two at 75. Is that proper dosing? Um, injections are being done every three weeks, and he has not needed a transfusion for six weeks. Well, I like the last part of that. Not needing a transfusion for six weeks sounds very encouraging to me. Um, yes, it is weight-based. There's a formula for it. Usually you start at a standard dose for the first two doses every three weeks apart, just like he's getting. And then you bump it up a dose level if somebody still needs transfusions or hasn't responded for the next two doses. And actually after four doses, you can bump it up to a higher dose. So it is weight-based. Pharmacies each have slightly different rules about how they'll round the dose. And if they don't have it, if they don't have to open a whole nother vial and waste some of that vial, they prefer not to for an expensive medicine. So they'll try to round it to something that's, that's within 10% of the correct dose. And that's usually, uh, the convention is that that's normal. And that's usually okay. And so it's weight-based. It's every three weeks. I like the fact he's responding. And they can escalate the dose to higher dose levels according to the FDA approval to try to get more benefit from it if, it, if it's not, if that benefit's not holding. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from John. It looks like it's a three-part question. If tr if transfusions required every one to two weeks, what is the best treatment? And what is the lowest general HGB that must be transfused? 
And you also said, what yeah. is the high ferritin level that is acceptable? Yeah, John. So that's a very common situation you're in. I'm, I'm sorry you're in that situation, but um, the standard is to is to make sure the hemoglobin stays above seven. Um, between seven and eight in a normal situation, you'll start arranging to give blood, and usually you get about a one a one point bump per per unit of blood. So if your hemoglobin seven point five, and you get two units of blood, you expect to be over nine and close to nine point five on average. Now, if somebody has heart disease or somebody has COPD or really a lot of fatigue, you can run people at a higher level. We've got many patients who we don't wait for it to go less than seven. We will keep them above eight or rarely um, above eight and a half and sometimes even nine. And that's an individualized decision and a discussion you can have with your, with your oncologist. Um, in terms of the treatment, if you're uh, the standard would be to, be to be in a red cell injection. If your erythropoietin level, it's called an EPO level, is less than 500, then they'll normally start you on erythropoietin, either Aranesp or Procrit, or one of the biosimilars uh, that, that work just as well. If your erythropoietin level is over 500, they're not going to work. And that's a situation where we would prescribe Lisbatercept. And Lisbatercept or Rebozil is a new drug that we just talked about that, um, in that last question in the presentation. It was only recently FDA approved, but that can work also in about in about a third of patients, 35 to 40 percent of patients. So there is another option. One last thing I'll say, and this is um, a detailed point: if the MDS has a variant called ringed sideroblasts, sometimes the addition of a white cell growth factor to the red cell shots, even if the white cells are fine, can be beneficial. We routinely do that. Some studies in Europe showed that could help. And so that's also something your oncologist can consider. But the standard is to start you on the red cell injections to pick the one based on your EPO levels. If those are not working, then we start talking about lenalidomide as an option or sometimes even azacitidine if, if you're still needing transfusion. Okay. Um, the next question is from Fred. Over time, does the cytopene chemotherapy treatments become less effective? If so, could you restart the treatment after a six month or more hiatus period and have once again be effective? Well, there are two answers to that. But the, the first answer is yes. One of the problems with these treatments is they don't work forever. And uh, we know the average person is, is on them. Well, the average person is on them less than a year because it doesn't work for everybody. I've had patients where they're on them for two years or three years and sometimes even beyond. But it can happen that they stop working or they start to fail after a while. Um, we try not to stop the injections uh, just because, or the treatments, just because it's hard to get the benefit back when you restart them. That's an anecdote, but that's been my experience, and many would tell you they've had that same experience. If they stop working, the standard thing to do is to, do, is to stop and consider doing a bone marrow biopsy and look and see what's going on in the bone marrow, maybe even do mutation testing to see what other things are happening that might change what you, uh, what might explain it or might change your options for treatment. And sometimes you can change from D cytobine to azacytidine, although the experience doesn't work very often. If you found the bone marrow looked a little more aggressive, if the blast count were higher, there are some studies showing that the addition of, uh, of venetoclax and using the alternate drug, if you're on D cytobine, switching to azacytidine and adding venetoclax could sometimes induce remission. But that's, the, that's a little bit of a speculative area, and that's a case-by-case case that you'd want to talk to your oncologist about. So I, I hope that helps answer that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from John. When should we consider oral chelation? Can we give with transfusion? Oh, that's right. There was a question about the ferritin level also. Um, Yes, you can give it with transfusions. That's not the most effective way to do it. So a lot of people get um, get iron chelation uh, at the time of transfusion, um, but it's much more effective to be on an oral agent chronically. We typically start talking about it if the ferritin level is over 1,500, and if the ferritin level goes over 2,500, then we're, then we're definitely talking about it. Not every oncologist believes in chelation. Let me tell you, the, the medicines are a little bit expensive sometimes, um, have some side effects. Sometimes you can have some stomach upset. You have to watch kidney function, a few other things with it. My experience is most people do very well if you start at low dose and work your way up to full dose. 
And when the ferritins over 1500 were often talking about starting BFAR Cyrox, we used the, the trade name is Jade New. Pardon me if you can see me on the screen. I'm just moving because my trying to find a comfortable position. But uh, Jade New, uh, we find, is uh, better tolerated. Um, and then you have to wait three to six months to see how that goes. Um, getting chelation IV at the time of transfusions helps a little bit, but it's not a good long-term option on its own. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Richard. Considered Jade New last year, but PBM does not have it on their preferred list. Would cost me about a half a million a year. Parental meds are free to patients on Medicare. How would you use parenteral deferoxamine there exactly? Yeah, I'm sorry for that. And um, sorry about the Jade New. It is an expensive medicine if you have to pay for it. There's an older version called X Jade, um, which you should ask about just in case that is on the formulary. The parenteral desferoxamine uh, uh, is a, a little more old fashioned, but it works. And until we had the oral agents 15 years ago, we used to give it. It's a little more cumbersome because you have to give it as a an overnight infusion. You put you get a little subcutaneous pump with a small needle, not hard to do. You learn how to do it after a few days. And when you go to bed at night, you take this 10 hour infusion overnight through a small pump and a small infusion pump. And you do that five days a week. And it's a little awkward when you start, but you get used to it. And that can be very effective to go on to parenteral uh, desferoxamine. So that's not a bad option. It's just a little more cumbersome and um, means you have to, just like a diabetic would inject themselves, you have to put a small needle under your skin and you tape in place and home health will help you set that up. And then there's some monitoring that your oncologist does. Again, you want an oncologist who has experience with that because it's not done often anymore. 20 years ago, we did it. And, um, and that is available. Okay. We have another question from John. What is the best cardiac monitor for iron overload? Yeah, we've set up a clinic working with, uh, we have a specialist in our liver in our liver group, and we have a cardio-oncologist who's a cardiologist who works with us, and we all try to coordinate this. Really, the best test is to do an MRI of your liver and heart. And when you get that MRI done, um, at Mayo Clinic, they will routinely do this protocol, but there's a protocol they have to apply called T2-STAR. And a T2 star is just um, a way of them measuring how long the magnetic signal lingers. And so um, the best way to measure it is with a T2 star MRI. That, and you should ask for it to be done of liver and heart. That will give you an estimate of how much heart, of how much iron's in the liver and also whether there's iron deposition in the heart. And that's the way to do it. In theory, you could have a heart biopsy, but don't do that. Um, that would be really extraordinary to have that done. And what you really want to do is with an MRI and make sure they do it with the T2 star protocol. Okay, thank you. We have another question from John. What kind of treatments are there for AML? Yeah, um, John, AML is a difficult thing and um, we have a lot of experience with that though. So we know that about a third of people after MDS at some point can have it turned to AML. If you've been on previous treatment with azacitidine or decitabine, that AML can be a little more resistant. Now, there are ways to get people into remission. There are treatments available, but you're talking about chemotherapy-based treatments. And there are really two strategies, simplistically. One is, can you control the disease, improve the blood counts, and keep that control going for a while, six months, 12 months, 18, maybe longer sometimes. The second is, is that a situation you can maybe try and cure it by giving aggressive chemotherapy like you would for a young patient and then following it up with a bone marrow transplant? The chemotherapy that seems to be most effective in this situation is called CPX351 or Vixios. And it's FDA approved and it's more effective in AML arising from MDS than other chemotherapies, but it's heavier. And so that's a situation where you want to go to an experienced leukemia center or center that deals with MDS and AML so they can put those options on the table, make an assessment as to that person's strength and fitness and goals, and then try and find a way to achieve those goals because there are options, but it's not easy. And I'm sorry to say that. 
Okay, um, we have another question from Richard. He asked the question before about the parenteral deferoxamine. He wants to know, do you think this will be similar with an oral in Covey? Hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Yes. Um, I, we're at a very difficult stage in medicine in America. Um, we have the most amazing technology in the world. We have new medicines coming. These technologies are difficult and expensive to develop. And uh, just because of the um, free enterprise system when, and, and that we live in and the open market system, the companies that build these want to try to, uh, for understandable reasons, that you know they want to make profit, they want to get their expenses back, they want to pay their shareholders. And so the medicines end up being expensive. There are programs for all of these new medicines for subsidies, but not everybody's eligible for those subsidies. And so that's a situation where you want to work with a social worker in your practice, or if it's at the VA or university hospital or public health hospital, you want to try and find with a social worker or a case manager, how can you access those programs to try to get subsidies or copay assistance on that? The Encobi is going to be expensive. I have not prescribed it yet since it was approved. Um, it's just an oral version of D-cytobine that's absorbed, and so it'll be easier to take than coming in five days a week, but it's going to be expensive. And so that's one where you're going to have to do the math to see what your copay will be, what patient assistance is out there. Um, it is the future, though, moving towards more oral medications. And so I'm hoping at some point we can get a better system for patients to get support for that because it can be a real hardship. Thank you, Dr. Foran. Um, we have another question from Fred. When using loose Patercept, why is it important not to let the hemoglobin count go above 11.5? Um, yeah, there's a good, it's a really good question. With, with erythropoietin, with standard EPO, whether it's Procrit or Aranesp or one of the new biosimilars, there were studies that showed that if you drive the hemoglobin too high, you can increase the risk of blood clot and stroke. And, um, and so it was determined that above 11, people don't really feel better. You don't get incremental benefit in terms of function. And so there wasn't a compelling reason to do that. I think there was also a decision by Medicare and by CMS to say, hey, let's make sure since this is an expensive medicine that we're giving in a way where people are really getting benefit and not overdoing it just to drive up the number too high if we can't show that's going to be safe. With Lespatercept, to my knowledge, there's not data that if it goes above 11, that it's dangerous. But if it goes above 11, it's probably not beneficial. And so I suspect they're just taking the experience from the previous drugs, uh, the Procrit or the Aranesp or the biosimilar, uh, Epigen if you're in Europe, and they're saying, hey, you know, above 11, there may be some risks of, of blood clot and stroke. Let's just not take that chance with those batter steps. I suspect that's the case. And since people feel as well as they're going to at 11 or higher, often 10 and a half to 11 or higher, there's no need to push that. I think that's the rationale. Uh, but that, I actually was not part of the approval. I don't know what the FDA discussion is on that. I have not seen any data to really support that, but I believe, I think I'm right, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from John. Have MDS, MPN being treated with Jacopy for a year, treated with Vidazas for mm -hmm. six months, no real improvement in transfusion frequency, should treatment be continued indefinitely? Yeah, John. So th there's a unique group of diseases called MDS, MPN. We have some features of MDS, but you also have some strange blood count proliferation. And it's a little bit of a hybrid disease and uh, not always easy. Now, the jacophy or the ruxolitinib can help shrink the spleen and help people feel better and get rid of symptoms. The people who take it tend to do better long term. So there's an upside. But the downside is there's often some anemia. After six months, that anemia frequently levels out, but doesn't always go away. Um, it's not exactly clear how to help that anemia, where the red cell shots will work with it. If the spleen grows back or the symptoms come back, or if your doctor and together with you decide that the jacophy is really not working, there's an alternative medicine that's FDA approved called fedratinib, uh, also called enrebic, uh, that you can, you can take. That was approved last year. 
And that can sometimes work 30 to 40% of the time when Jack is fails. So there is an alternate option. It also can have some anemia, so not a perfect response to the anemia, but helps the disease. There are some newer medications in development that may treat the disease and improve hemoglobin. One of them is called momolotinib, but that's not FDA approved. And you'd have to try to get that on a clinical trial. My colleague at Mayo Clinic Arizona, Dr. Gene Palmer, has a trial of looking at momolotinib in that setting. And so if you go online to clinicaltrials.gov and look for momolotinib, M-O-M-E-L-O-T-I-N-I-D, you may find a clinical trial near you and you can look and see if that's an appropriate option for you. Um, But in general, we try not to stop the jacophy unless we really think it stopped working because it seems to smooth out the long-term behavior of the disease and even that out, and that may be beneficial on itself. Occasionally, blood transfusion is helpful too. Uh, not always fun, but, but that can be really useful. Okay, we have another question from Fred. J- Janice, it's- these j- these are hard questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Goodness>. <laughs> You're doing a great yeah. job, though. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I thought it would be a low-key sad. Okay, well, yeah. anyway, keep going. I'm, we're good. Okay. Another question from Fred. In low-risk MDS, how long does it take for all the bone marrow stem cells to become cancerous? You know, there's no way to answer that, or I don't know how to answer that. Um, We know there are still some, usually some normal bone marrow cells left behind that just get pushed aside and overgrown by the damaged ones. And it's not that the uh, they all turn cancerous. It's just that the damaged ones or the cancerous ones overgrow the other ones and suppress them. And by the time you know you have MDS, that's usually the predominating stem cell growing is the damaged one. There is experience from the 1990s of giving heavy leukemia chemotherapy to clear out MDS cells, especially if the blast count is high. And in some people seeing recovery of normal counts because those normal suppressed bone marrow cells can kick back in. The problem is it's not always the case that they kick back in. So we don't do that very often anymore. And um, Really, uh, uh, as you treat the damaged cells, the MDS cells with azacytidine, they start to grow more effectively. You also suppress some of them, and some normal cells may grow. Um, but apart from that, I don't have a really good biological answer for you. And um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. I have a question from Chuck. Is there an advantage for a patient with low risk MDS to maintain regular contact? with an MDS center of excellence in addition to their local hematologist? Yeah, Chuck, there is. Um, Thank you for asking that question. And so the world has changed and COVID-19 has really driven a lot of this change. We have shifted at Mayo Clinic, and I know colleagues at other centers of excellence have as well, to offering virtual visits where we can do consults, uh, virtual consults electronically. Um, Medicare will, and insurance companies frequently allow us to bill for them. So we, it's cost effective. We can find the time. We can schedule that. We can review outside records. We can give advice. And then we can send notes or collaborate with the local oncologist. I'll tell you, I've gotten many patients in North Florida, Central Florida, South Georgia, Florida Panhandle, who are treated locally in Tallahassee, in Ocala, in Daytona Beach, in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, many places, Valdosta, others, who um, see us or see us virtually on an electronic visit. We send records or share records with their primary oncologist, and we help provide guidance. Sometimes we ask for an inpatient visit if we need to repeat a bone marrow for special testing, and then we can educate patients and the oncologist about what clinical trials might be there that may be worth traveling for. And so that absolutely can be done. I know my colleagues at Moffitt Cancer Center can do it. I know the group at Cleveland Clinic can do it. I know we can do it. We have experience at all three of our cancer center sites in Phoenix and Jacksonville and in Rochester, Minnesota. And so that's a real thing. And uh, you can absolutely reach out to the Center of Excellence and see if it's possible through their appointments office to look for a virtual visit or a virtual consult and then try to get value from that. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Curtis. What is the status of IDFA? with regard to MDS treatment? Yeah, um, somewhere between 5% and 15% of patients, let's say 5 to 10% for sake of argument, who have MDS will develop a mutation in their MDS cells in a gene called IDH. There's two versions of IDH, IDH1, IDH2. And 
That can happen in leukemia also. And in AML, in acute myeloid leukemia, the FDA has approved these pills, IDH1 inhibitor um, called ivocidinib and IVH2 inhibitor called enosidinib or adifa. And so we were part of a study looking at the IDH1 inhibitor that included MDS patients, and that study's back open again. So some centers of excellence and some clinical trial centers have access to clinical trials for the IDH1 inhibitor um, uh, called ivocidinib, and I'm just blanking on the uh, trade name. I'm sorry, on the uh, trade name. I'm so sorry, it's uh, uh, Tibsovo. And then for Adifa, I don't know if there are clinical trials, but there is some experience in MDS. In those, in that experience, some patients can actually get improvement in their blood counts, reduction in their blasts, improvement in their bone marrow. So we think it really may help. And we're doing studies in that in that area. And there are new IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors that are being developed and going to open on clinical trials that are oral. Where you come to a clinical trial center, you get assessed, you take those pills at home, you come back intermittently to be checked. So the answer is you should absolutely bring it up with your oncologist. You may be told it's off-label and not FDA approved, but they can still prescribe it. And then you can appeal to the insurance company if they don't fill it. And your oncologist, or more likely at a center of excellence, if your oncologist can't do it, can write a letter of support quoting some of the data to try to do what's called a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation, where the oncologist will talk to the insurance company doctor to try to convince them that it's worth doing. I end up doing a peer-to -con peer conversation several times a month if we need to get access to a medicine like this for somebody with MDS or leukemia. And so there is a pathway for it. It's not a guarantee you'll get it. The drugs are really too expensive to buy. They're, it, it's kind of crazy expensive but it's worth looking into. And there are also some clinical trials. We have a clinical trial for IDH1. I don't know where they have them for IDH2, but I think they're out there. That's an evolving field. I, I'm, I'm glad you're asking that question. And it's absolutely uh, worth seeking advice at an MDS center of excellence or a cancer center of excellence or through your primary oncologist that they can help you to get access to it and they help. Okay, we have a two-part question from Phil. Jan Janice, can I, can I just ask, is there help with the MDS Foundation for, for that kind of access to medicines that may be beneficial in MDS but aren't approved there but are approved in another indication? And uh, Adifa is an example. Do you happen to know? Um, I don't. Um, they can always contact our patient liaison, Audrey Hassan, in the office, and oh. she'll be able to help out. Yeah, Audrey's fantastic, by the way, for anybody listening who uh, reaches out to the MDS. Not that Janice isn't, by the way. Um, sorry, Janice. She's the, but yeah, Audrey's, she's the uh, yeah, she's a she's really a great advocate. So um, that's worth that's worth a phone call. Okay, so we have a two part question from Phil. After un undergoing HMA treatment and the blood counts are normal, can HMA treatment be stopped and just monitored for relapse? And can the frequency of HMA treatment be decreased for, for to six to eight weeks instead of four weeks after a remission is reached? Yeah, so so it's difficult. What we've what I've experienced and what we've learned is that when you stop the medicine, you often lose the benefit over a few months. And so you don't want to just stop it. And when you restart it, I wouldn't say that this is a not everybody agrees on this, but my experience is if you try to restart it, you often don't get that benefit back again. So I personally would not be in favor of you stopping it outright. Now, if you're having a side effect and you can't do it and you can't travel to it, you have to figure out what's right in your life. I get that. But if you can continue, you can. What we frequently do, especially after a year of continued remission or benefit or normal blood count, is we'll start to reduce the frequency of visits every five weeks for a couple of times and every six weeks. That can be done. If you're on azacitidine, we'll often drop it from seven days to five days. And my I can't prove it's as good, but my experience is that you typically hold the response as well with that. And at least you make it a little more manageable for the person. And it's one of the problems with the HMAs is that you have to continue them. We haven't figured out when to stop them or how to safely stop them. I'm hopeful that some trials in the future will find better combinations or better maintenance or even oral versions that we can then transition to. There's an oral decitabine called Encovi, a type of decitabine. There's going to be an oral azacitidine in leukemia. We'll see if it, if it works in MDS. And so there may be oral options that make that easier. But the short answer is I would not advocate you stopping it. I'd recommend you try to continue it. But you can negotiate five or six-week intervals and even sometimes shorten the number of days. 
And my experience is that you maintain your benefit. And that's a case-by-case discussion. You can definitely look into that. Okay, um, we have a question from Peter. He would like to know any comment on trip eight. You have to repeat that last word. Any comments on what? Please comment on trip eight dash eight. I have to tell you that I don't know what that is or what that means. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say no comment. <laughs> Okay. Um, that could be an autocorrect from something else like trip haze. Um, or if it's, the, if it's trip, if it's trip eight, I have to tell you, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. And we have a question from Mark. I have had increasing ferritin levels over the past few years, but I have never needed a transformation as my blood, I assume he means transfusion as my blood levels are not low enough. Ferritin now over a thousand and liver is at 8.1. So started Jade and New a month ago. Any thoughts on why ferritin is increasing without transfusions? Yes. Um, so there are other ways to absorb iron. And I've had a number of patients who are middle-aged and a few who are even older, one woman who was 70, who I couldn't figure out why her iron was elevated. And I did testing for hemochromatosis. And it turns out that they had occult hemochromatosis. There's a, an inherited disease where people can absorb iron more readily just from what they eat and, um, and more avidly. And you can get iron buildup from that. So one thing to do would be to uh, ask for iron saturation testing with a check in iron and a TIBC. If they did an MRI and the T2 star was at eight, well, then it sounds like it's real. It sounds like you're really absorbing iron and it's being deposited in the liver. And so if that's the case, you should be on, you, you should be considering um, chelation. And I would recommend testing for hereditary hemochromatosis. That's a simple genetic blood test. It's a standardized test. And you're looking for a, an inherited variant of the gene that helps you absorb iron. There's two variants, three variants that are well known, but the most common one is called C2A2I and the other one's called H63D. But you can ask your doctor whether hemochromatosis is a possibility and whether you should be tested for that. And please make sure they check not just a ferritin, but an iron and a TIBC, because there are situations where the ferritin can be falsely elevated if you have inflammation or infection. And so you have to actually check an iron and an iron binding capacity to look for your iron saturation to confirm it's real. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Belinda. I just had a BMT and found abundant iron stores and scarring fibrosis. Do these two items need attention or is there any way to rid the body of them, especially the scarring fibrosis? I'm gonna give you a mixed answer there. So absolutely you can do things to get rid of the iron. This is iron buildup. Um, that's number one. Um, you can, um, there's some subtlety to this question because it depends on why the scarring or why the, why the bridging fibrosis is there in the liver. If it's from iron buildup, then that can be addressed. There are some people who may in the past have had hepatitis that can leave that. And there are some variants of MDS that sometimes some of the bone marrow cells can travel to. Earlier, we talked about MDS overlap with MPN. And in that situation, some bone marrow cells actually uh, start to grow in the liver. It's called extra hematopoiesis. When that happens, you have some some fibrosis there. Finally, rarely graft versus host disease can contribute to that. So, if there's bridging fibrosis, that's really early scarring, and that may be permanent. But what you want to do is stop that from worsening, so that you really want to see a uh, experienced hepatologist working with your transplant team to try to figure out why the fibrosis is there, what the background cause of it was, and to go after it. And if it's something reversible, you want to do that because you want to prevent that from getting worse. In many patients, that doesn't change your long-term possibilities, but you don't want it to get worse. And so that's one, I bet your transplant team is working with a, a liver doctor already, but that's one where you'd really want to coordinate that care. Okay, 
Thank you. That's all the time that we have for questions. For those of you who still have questions, please feel free to reach out to me at ahassan at mds-foundation.org. If you missed out or would like to revisit this webinar, be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with the link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the MDS Foundation, thank you for joining us. This concludes today's program.